And we're on. Whew. Well, thanks everybody for coming to the rescheduled MySex since the snowstorm last week took us out. Um, just a couple of announcements that we can talk about. Uh, one, how many people is this the first MySec? Ah. So MySec Jackson, we meet um, twice a month. So it's usually the second Tuesday of every month. And it's also the last Tuesday of every month that you silence your phone. Um, and the last Tuesday of every month is our social. And we're pretty easy going. Just come talk security uh, if you have ideas. Um, also, I'm always looking for speakers. So if you have a 10 minute talk or a 45 minute talk that you want to try out, this is a perfect group to do it. We're very forgiving. We're not too crazy. <laughs> except for I was not told I can yeah. only do 10 minutes, so that's a little bit of bullshit, my friend. <laughs> well, 10 minutes is for the lightning talks we tend uh, to do, and then a full talk is usually about Tonight will be a lightning talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple more announcements, and if you're not familiar with the other locations, we also have Lansing, which is on Wednesdays, the second Wednesday, and the last Wednesday of the month is our social. Um, we also have Grand Rapids and our Southfield, um, and those are the second Thursday and last Thursday of the month. So there's a bunch of meetings going on. It sounds like we're going to be having also coming up soon is the Detroit location. So we're starting to expand a little bit out there. So there's tons of choices. Um, also, we're going to try and start informing you of other events going on close to the area um, because there's also a, a Lansing ISSA chapter that does meet the third Thursday of every month. Um, also, is there anyone, does anyone have other events that they know about or things that they want to bring attention to the community? Like other cool things. Like, like Converge? Um, that's on the list, man. Come on. Just trying to hype you up. Man. Um, uh, one thing we can at least have a celebration for is no. that we just got some second place <laughs> winners not. here from the, the last. When, when was the actual competition for CCDC? Saturday. Last Saturday. So congratulations. And, <laughs> and when will you guys be going to the regionals? <laughs> All right, so they got to win the wild card, which is when? March 2nd. March 2nd? All right. That's exciting. And congratulations again. They brought their trophy here. <laughs> there it is. Trophy time. All right. Otherwise, yeah, so Converge uh, is coming up. It's less than 90 days. That's pretty crazy. Um, I'll be opening up our volunteer roster, so that'll be going out if you, anyone wants to volunteer. Um, we also still have our CFP open, so if you have a presentation or a workshop that you think you'd like to try out, or just go ahead and submit it to us, because we're still open. Um, also, GERCON uh, CFP is also open, so it's another place that if you have a talk that you want to kind of present on a bigger stage, go ahead and check that out. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that's it, unless there's any other events. Any other events? Okay. Well, on that note, I'll turn it over to Christian Kabashi and his wonderful talk on I'm a Little Teapot. Worked for me for four years, still can't pronounce my last name. Nope. So thank you for that. I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> you got to look him in the eyes when you do it. <laughs> um, so my name is Christian Kapasi. I am the Director of Incident Response threat and vulnerability management here at Consumers Energy. So my, my time, my team does the uh, incident response, malware analysis, security monitoring, as well as vulnerability management, and also the red teaming pen test and adversary operations. So pretty much all the red team and all the blue team and everything in between. So why am I here besides Kyle made me? Um, yeah. <laughs> So I read a uh, blog post probably about a month ago uh, from Pseudo June, who works at East Tire, and it was really interesting because um, we talked about honeypots at work probably since I started here four and a half years ago, and we have never done anything about it. Um, every year we talk about it, like, yeah, that's really cool, let's do it, and then we never do it. Um, third, more importantly, um, I've done a lot of talks about the MITRE ATT&CK framework, and my team doesn't want to hear me talk about it, so that was my scheduled talk again, and I was... Uh, urge to not talk about it, so I, that's why I'm here. I haven't heard that talk yet. You've heard parts of it. <laughs> you live it. <laughs> um, most importantly, I wanted to get out of my comfort zone. Um, you know, my my day-to-day -day is meetings, Excel, and PowerPoint, so I don't get to do as much technical work anymore. So I wanted to pick something to say, hey, this is really cool, and figure out um, how much I suck. Um, so really quick basics. What is a honeypot? 
Uh, it's a system that's there to throw off an attacker, give them some systems to go and attack. Um, so you can see them coming at you and say, hey, they're right here. They haven't gone over here and try to get them out before they actually go after thing, anything real. Um, there's different forms. There's things like honey tokens. Um, so things that you can set up like a fake domain admin account. So this account's never used. So when you see people start trying to use it, it's a pretty good sign that uh, you got some trouble. Um, there's also things like Honey Documents, where they have some kind of call home features. So if you put some documents out that say, you know, social security numbers, HR data, the minute they start leaving, they'll call out and say, hey, I was just taken. So you know that's uh, a sign of trouble. Um, basically, a form of deception. Um, deception is kind of a, a new cool word where you see a lot more companies coming out where all they say is, you know, our product is uh, we do deception. It's like, well, what do you do? It's like, well, they're pretty much a honeypot. They just have more advanced features, and a lot of them are throwing more another buzzword automation in it. So it's like, yeah, we have a honeypot, and automatically we do something about it. So don't pay for overpriced stuff. Uh, there's three main types of honeypots, um, low, medium, and high. And that just references what you can do with it. Um, so what an adversary, what are they going to see? Um, Low interaction, again, it's the lowest form. It basically means there's really not much there. It'll kind of emulate a service or at least have a, a port to be appear uh, to be open so they can go and try to, you know, throw a username and password at it. That's about it. And as you go up, it's more and more um, realistic for them. We're at high interaction. It's usually like a full-blown system where there's different networks and they can actually try to uh, do the normal reconnaissance and all the other uh, attacks phases of attack and they'll think it's a legitimate system. So obviously things like that are much better in the grand scheme of things because one of the problems you'll see with more of the low and medium interaction is for the most part anyone that's really attacking this after about a couple minutes you're like oh, this is fake, this is bullshit and they're going to go on somewhere else. But um, it does have some good data and that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, this is kind of my point. I, I basically just did a really quick Nmap scan of my honeypot. Um, the problem with some of these honeypots um, is they're basically there and it's like, hey, is this port open? I sure am. So it's automatically opening up ports based off what traffic it's seeing. So when you do an Nmap, basically every port is open. I cut off anything I didn't know about and ones this to make this list fit on my presentation. But again, to an attacker, they're not going to probably think this is a realistic network. They're like, no one's that dumb. Yes, there are people like that, and you could have a few of these things open, but it's definitely uh, is going to make them probably take a step back and be pissed off and find really things to tack you at. But uh, this was kind of eye-opening for me because I knew the honeypots I installed, and I knew what ports they opened, and I did an end map, and I'm like, hmm, everything's open. Awesome. Uh, so tonight, uh, specifically for honeypots, I want to talk about Teapot. Um, I like the name. had a good, uh, good logo, so I picked it. Um, but no, it was one of the first ones that I saw that actually had dockerized versions of other popular honeypots. So basically, the, the CERT team at T-Mobile created it. Um, it, it also includes uh, uh, Suricata for an IDS and Elk, uh, mostly for um, getting the logs into Cabana. Um, these are all the honeypots that are on there. And there's different options. Um, one of the things I found out is that when you choose kind of like the default or all option, um, pretty bad move. <laughs> uh, your shit's going to break quite a bit because it's, it's really not meant to run all this stuff, at least with the equipment I'm using. Um, and I even beefed it up more than the recommended setting. So. I'm going to go through a few of these. Uh, most of these are ones I wouldn't run in my normal environment because I don't care if someone's going after ADB Honey, which is uh, the Android debug bridge. So um, I don't care if someone goes after my Amazon Fire Stick. <laughs> um, but it's, it's there. It's one of the default ones. Um, I'm going to go through these kind of uh, quick. Again, there is a Cisco ASA that is really there for that one CVE only. So again, um, I feel like the effort to stand up a honeypot just for this one CVE, um, it'd probably be quicker just to patch your shit, but hey, it's, a, it's just me. Uh, Conpot, this was one that I want to actually go and do more. Um, actually, probably set this one up because being an energy company, um, this is what we think our adversaries are going after. Um, this one only has a few ports, so it's things like Modbus, I think SNMP, um, and a few other um, 
types of ports that you mostly see in an industrial control system. Uh, Kauri is SSH and Telnet. Uh, Dianea is kind of, this is probably one of the issues that I'm having, is this is one that kind of sets things up dynamically, so it starts just opening up ports, which totally uh, screwed things up for me. So lesson learned, uh, have a better uh, plan of attack when I start looking at these. Uh, elastic pot, um, it's a honey pot for elastic. Um, and it's funny because some of these, um, just in my thinking, and I'll show you some of the data, is like, oh, I'm guessing, you know, this is where people are going to try to go after, at least doing searches. And this is a uh, elastic pot and con pot are the two honey pots that I had the least interaction with. Um, again, I'm just hosting this on a EC2 instance on Oz, so it's not like I'm saying I'm an energy company, but uh, I thought there'd be a little more traffic going to it. Um, this is another multi-use one. You can basically tell it what ports you want to emulate. Um, and that's another issue is there's some that uh, were fighting for a while because they both want to open up the, the same port. So I had to disable certain things. So again, uh, have a better plan of attack of what you want to look for. Uh, another one that does FTP and TFTP. Uh, SMTP for Maloney. Uh, RDP Honeypot, this one was cool because I figured this would be uh, sought after and is. Um, this is a uh, web application Honeypot, basically has two parts. Uh, Suricata is an IDS that uh, was basically built as an alternative to Snort um, quite a long time ago. Um, mostly it was, um, the cool thing about Suricata when it came out is it was basically um, it was multi-threaded, um, and at the time, Snort was not, so it, uh, it ran a little bit better, and a lot more people are starting to use this, things like Security Onion and others, you, you can you run either or. And Elk, uh, which is the uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and Kibana. So basically, you have your uh, search engine, your Logstash, which is actually taking all of the events and putting them into something like Elk, and then Kibana, which allows you to Visualize all your data and look at pretty little things, which is what I'm going to go through in a little bit. So what I started with was basically I uh, set up an Amazon account. I started with the free tier because uh, a lot of the information I read said you should be able to use that. I then spent uh, the next week trying to make it work, and it wouldn't. <laughs> so I uh, had to go with an actual larger instance that I paid for. Um, the other issue that I ran into is the blog I read kind of had instructions of how to do it, and I followed them step by step, and my shit would not work. So I figured, oh, I'm just doing something dumb. So I started reaching out to the guy. I'm like, hey, did you ever have any of these issues? He's like, no. So um, after a little bit of troubleshooting, it came to be there was a, a memory issue. So um, again, I had to upgrade my instance to get anything to actually start. Please save the questions for the end. I'm just kidding. The question is, how much does it cost to run this beast? It depends on how often you leave it up. Um, I originally started with the free instance for about a week, just because I didn't really spend much time on getting it to work. Um, the problem I was having was I was able to see all the honey pots were up. Um, I could see the data in the JSON files because each honeypot actually has a, a separate data directory. So I knew that was working, yet when I went to Kibana, there was no data to look at. Um, finally, um, when I tried to do an upgrade and it, I saw an error at the very top, it was like a, a Java out of memory error. So I upgraded and then I ran it, I would say almost two weeks and that was like $50. Um, but I let it run 24 seven and You'll see some of the reasons why. I mean, some of the data, I mean, this thing got just trashed. I mean, I knew the internet was just a dumpster fire, but it was like, I hit go, like, to go, and then, like, within 15 seconds, it's, like, just racking up attacks. So I was like, Jesus, people have nothing better to do. But you'll see a lot of it. I mean, it's just automated garbage. But, again, like I said, um, it was roughly, depends on when I started, but $50 to $80. And, but, that, like I said, that was, that was two weeks. So I, I kept turning it off because I didn't want to. <laughs> didn't want to pay too much for it. But um, one thing I will say is you probably can get away with the free EC2 instance if you limit the amount of Docker containers or honeypots that you choose. So um, you can also, I'll have a slide later, but you can basically choose 
choose what you want to start. So you can actually say, hey, I just want the honey pots. I don't want to have elk. If I already have an elk instance, I can have that run somewhere else. You in the background. <laughs> It's um, that you had running in teapot. What would be the one that you say you should run because it got the most action if you wanted to? Well, I, I think it's different. Like what I got the most hits off of may not be something that I really would care about. Um, having Suricata was on there was pretty cool because I'll show that in a minute, but um, out of the like top 10 um, different uh, signatures, like the top one was like almost 2 million, and the next one was like so far low, it was like wow. It's like you could definitely tell what they were hitting on from that section. Um, other than that, it was, um, I believe Telnet and SSH were the top services. Thank you for the question though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so like I said, um, following the blog, I had issues with it, so I just went to T-Mobile's site on GitHub, and they had um, a, a universal installer that they just came out with. So again, I just built, built my instance, and then I just ran their installer, um, and then everything was working. Um, and phase three from the Underpants Gnome is profit, so here we are today. Um, so the first thing I did after I set up my account uh, was enable MFA and then change the inbound fire rules because by default uh, it's uh, any any rule to SSH, which is a bad thing, but uh, you do what you want. You guys are crazy. Um, again, um, this is the actual um, EC2 instance I ended up with, um, the 16 gig of RAM. Like I said, uh, the recommendation was like 6 to 8, which again, on full installation does not work. Um, hard drive size, I'm still doing pretty good on, and even memory. It's funny because like, the shit won't run on six to eight, yet I never really see anything taking up that memory, so I'm not sure what the real uh, <laughs> disconnect is, but uh, this was my only way to get this working. Um, and Ubuntu 1804, and I think, the, uh, I believe the blog was on Ubuntu 16, so I just said, well, let's slide the wheel and see if it uh, actually works. And again, um, your shit will not work if you do it that method, doing the full installation, so, uh, I would definitely suggest that when you actually choose the honey pots, or at least you can choose full install and then just disable uh, pretty much everything except for like one or two. Um, so this is what I was talking about before. Uh, there's three different, uh, four different methods of choices once you start installing teapot. Um, I chose the full installation because after a week of things not working, I'm like, well, maybe it's because, you know, number one's broke. Um, but no, full worked. Um, like I said, you can also just choose to only install the honey pots. You won't get Suricata or Elk. Um, and then they also have just the uh, number three, which is what I'm going to go with after I'm done with this. And it just has the con pot, which is more geared to the uh, ICS side. Um, next steps, um, again, most of it was just changing rules. Um, so once all the honey pots are up, uh, T-Pot will automatically um, uh, know that port 22 is no longer going to be used for SSH uh, for yourself, so they change that uh, to 64295, and then 64297 is your web Kibana interface, and it does that automatically. Um, again, through my trial and error, the first couple times when things weren't working, part of the issue um, was it would change the, automatically the rule uh, for SSH access, um, but it would never change uh, my Kibana instance, so for a little while I could SSH into it, but I couldn't actually use Kibana, which is uh, pretty much the point of what I wanted to do is actually see a lot of the data. Um, I do have a demo, I believe. <laughs> it, it's been hit or miss. Uh, the, the damn thing just it won't stay up, so I did take screenshots, and I am going to go over those, so I, I apologize for a lot of screenshots. I am going to try to at least go through a little bit at the end um, to actually show you what it looks like live. Um, but again, this, this is based off two weeks worth of data. Um, and like I said, uh, Cowrie, which is the SSH and Telnet, uh, was by far the number one attacked um, honeypot that I had up. Um, and then followed by, I, I thought the Cisco AS1, ASA1 and the Conpot. I thought the Conpot was low, like I said, you know, 
being in this industry, I guess I just feel like it's more important than it is, and someone's out there doing stupid shit against it, but no, it's all the other stuff that people are going after, just because most of it's all automated garbage, um, from what I could see. Um, the dashboards are very cool. You get a lot of information. Um, so it's, it's very cool just for myself, just because it's just, everything is just at a glance. You're able to see exactly all the information uh, that you want. And I love the map. The map's just fucking lit up. I mean, it's just like there's not one spot that's not covered on there. Um, so this is another graph they have that basically just shows you um, the honey pots that are being um, uh, active the most. And again, um, Kari was number one by, you know, 75%. Uh, this is uh, Puff using um, passive OS fingerprinting to try to determine, uh, <laughs> as you can see, it uh, did a great job. Uh, <laughs> a lot of unknowns out there, um, but again, it, I, I didn't find this data valuable um, just because I didn't know how realistic it really was. <laughs> Why, you don't think people use XP still, Kyle? No, no. <laughs> Um, this is kind of what I, I was hoping to do more analysis on, but uh, I failed completely. Uh, not going to lie, the snow saved my ass last week because I was so unprepared <laughs> and my demo, nothing was working. <laughs> and then today I'm like, ah, fuck it. And so this is, uh, uh, I'm sure you can barely tell, and really th thrown together at the last minute. Um, uh, this is one thing that I was actually really, really interested in to see if there was any sort of connection between what are the different countries going after? Is there a, something you can see that says, and again, I know this is horrible attribution because I'm going by geolocation, which really means nothing at all. Um, but at least from the data, I, uh, there is a uh, definitely discerning look at what you can see as far as like the, the United States um, was geared towards one way. And then as you go to the different countries, each of them had their own specific things they were looking at. Um, it's funny things, um, I'm trying to remember which one it's in there, but like usually it's the United States, Russia, uh, China, and I think Brazil usually is one of the top ones uh, as well. Um, this I thought was really cool. Um, so one thing I will show you is the way they have Kibana set up is they basically have a, a master dashboard for a teapot, which is all the data combined. And then each honeypot has its own dashboard as well. So as you click each one, you have all the same information, but it's geared specifically towards that sp uh, honeypot. So this data is for everything overall. So these are the top usernames um, that are being put into uh, the various honeypots as a, a means of accessing data. Trying to remember if this one has big. I think it's the password is like big butt. <laughs> Come on, maybe that's on the other one because I was laughing. I'm a child. <laughs> um, but I still thought this was cool. It's just like just visually able to see. Okay, what passwords uh, or what usernames do I have? You know, what things are default that we should probably go take a look at. So this was just it was cool stuff. Um, this is what I kind of was referencing before, where it talks about the different um, rules for Suricata that are being hit. Uh, so the double pulsar, I mean, you got 8 million hits. The next one's 250. I just thought that was a, a huge, huge thing. It's just kind of crazy that people are um, what they're going after. The rest of them are all different. I mean, basically, is there Telnet, is there VNC, is there RDP? So again, it gives you an idea, at least for this instance, what attackers are going after. So my main goal in this is once we actually get this at our company to kind of compare to say um, how similar is if we actually put something out there that's connected to consumers energy as far in name at least, how much different does it actually change? You know, are we actually seeing the same thing? You know, it's all this opportunistic stuff that everyone is seeing or are we seeing different things and people are going after us specifically? So hopefully that'll happen soon. I'll put a link kit board on for you. That? Shut up. Um, the other part of Suricata it just shows the actual uh, CVEs that are being attacked. So it's, yeah, it's it's really. Thank you for laughing. Uh, it's it's kind of scary if you look at them. It's like and it always kind of makes me laugh because it's anytime 
the past you know 10 years you know you look at a lot of these breaches you know people are always worried of about like zero days and all this stuff and it's always some old ass shit that they had on there that they don't patch that is and you can see it from here i mean the things that people are going after it's like jesus 2001 2006 so just kind of a eye opening for a lot of people that kind of tend to look towards what's happening as far as just kind of the wackiest stuff that's probably never going to happen and it's going to be something dumb and it's going to be default creds but that's me um, the other dashboard it has again is um, just the top attacking IPs as well as who owns those so and again for each one you get this same type of data so you can kind of see again um, who's what regions are going after Telnet and SSH versus which ones are going after RDP. So again, this was um, kind of like for me. Um, the second one was where I started. Um, it may work for you. Um, the top one is the actual uh, T-Mobile GitHub site where I actually uh, got their universal installer and it actually worked for me. Um, all right, Al. I'm going to attempt to see if this shit will work, but if anyone has any questions, please feel to randomly throw them at me. So as I mentioned, um, when you actually go to the web interface, um, you're able to see there has been a dashboard created for each of the honeypots, and then the teapot is, like I said, is the master one. And this one is only the last seven days. I had to lower it because not everything was uh, showing up, but did want to show you. That's exactly what I'm trying to show, so I, uh, I appreciate you keeping me on track. Welp. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, God. Awesome, now this shit's not working. All right. Uh, the other thing you can see is, again, uh, the user agents, which, again, may provide value. I mean, if you see weird things. Um, but, <laughs> again, these can be fake, but it's good to know who what they're using. And it's also another way to see if it's an actual, possibly a person, or just some a lot of scripted stuff that's just being thrown at you. Yeah, so this is ConPot, which is the ICS, and like I said, this is all the data. Um, I was really surprised, just the number of attacks. Um, it was funny, though, because on this one, yeah, all the pretty much the top attackers, attackers were, all, were all out of China. So you can tell Drago so that if you want, in case they don't know that. <laughs> I'm their man. I've just found this new information for them. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, wait for Kyle. Do you know what services from an ICS standpoint? Is this like PLCs? Is this yeah. Modbus? It's what? Modbus, SNMP, and there's two more that it has open that I can check for you if you want to wait. But uh, No, I was just curious what, you know, what it was simulating when it comes to ICS. Yeah, actually... Um, Conpot has 161, 2404, 623, 1025, yeah. So the good thing is when you actually look at your Docker containers, you can see what ports they're listening on, so you know. Except the ones that open up like a shit ton, they don't list those right here, so 
Um, yeah, the problem I had is um, a lot of them, because it's just a collection, when you go to their individual GitHubs, depending on which one it is, I mean, the information available really varies, so it was kind of a crapshoot. <laughs> This is, okay, cool. Um, did you actually try to connect to any of these as like a, you know, yourself to see what it looks like as an attacker or whatever? I did a few just to make sure it was working. Um, so there was one that was just like a web page and it gave you um, like, a, like a blog site that was like a WordPress blog site. Um, things like the Telnet and SSH I made sure. Well, first of all, the, the first time I did it, I had forgotten that uh, uh, SSH to, uh, changed ports so I could log in. <laughs> so yeah, my... Uh, my key, uh, my password uh, cert key is in there somewhere, I'm guessing. So <laughs> I didn't look for it yet, but because I didn't want it to be uh, in there that I searched for it. And you're like, what is that? Look at <laughs> That's my passphrase. <laughs> yeah, it's, some of them, I mean, are better than others. Um, like after a while, you know, it's like there's nothing actually behind it. Um, that's the only problem with some of these um, is that just after a while, I mean, it's good for research and that you're going to see a lot of what automated stuff is going on there, but actually finding a, what I would consider a real adversary, by the, you're, not, you're probably not going to be able to connect that based off the limited information they're going to be able to see. It's like they're going to know that this is garbage. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Just critiques. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. The person who does a hacking, uh, I can tell you that one, two, three, four, five, six is a common password. And it was interesting to see that because it's actually up there as the second biggest password being used. Um, so this actually matches what others like said company is seeing out in the wild as well. So lesson to everyone, don't use stupid passwords like one, two, three, four, five, six in your corporation. Um, the other thing, just as a helpful hint on this, is if you're going to run the freeware version, if you set the Java key within the Elastic stack to two gig, you should be able to run it um, with limited service and get along with it free. Um, just as a FYI. Well, thanks for letting everyone else hey, fucking be helped. And uh, you saw me flounder for two weeks and just sat there and laughed. And what was that <laughs> cool advice he just asked you or told you about? <laughs> Not repeat. <laughs> Really glad my team's here to support me. So uh, <laughs> feeling the love. So thank you. <laughs> um, I guess that's really it. I guess if there's any questions, the, the best thing that I thought this really had is it really had everything you needed to really kind of explore it on your own. And um, for the most part, it was easy to set up once uh, I actually got the right information. So it's just really cool. And like I said, I definitely want to set the con pod up and possibly some others just to kind of play more with. that there is actually specific honeypots that you can set up that will actually let an attacker connect to the server and actually dig through the service, right? Like maybe it was a, a, a fake Linux system that, you know, they go to Etsy mm. password and they- Yeah, if you would have been here earlier, I talked about that, but you came in late. Okay, I was making sure people got it. Thank, oh, you. thank you for doing the job. No, I, you what you I did meant- did a great job there. What I talked about earlier was just what they, the different classifications of the honeypots. So low, medium, and high interaction. So the high interaction ones is that. I mean, it's almost just like a virtual environment where everything they do actually looks realistic and it's really hard to determine that you're on some, you know, fake ass network. Uh, this is kind of on a different thread, but I was just kind of wondering about um, like kind of the honeypots that are more designed for like collecting malware samples. I don't know if you've if you looked into any of those or not. I didn't. When I first started out, I was looking at just the normal type honeypots that were mostly um, SSH and Telnet were the most prominent ones that I had been looking at. So it sounds like you have a good idea for a talk. You might want to talk to Kyle. That's a great way to get people to shut up. <laughs> you should go talk to Kyle. No, I'm good. <laughs> uh, I, out of curiosity, how many people have actually 
used that many times. How many people want to go try and play around with it? Thanks. Um, Jesus. I'm used to it. So one other comment about the sound of One more comment while you suck tonight. I would like to let this. <laughs> So you can craft as an attacker better attacks in the future. Um, this will show you exactly what you're doing right and wrong um, as you progress down each step of the honeypot, just as, a, as you carry on your married ways in your career. So you won't break anything in Amazon's cloud, I can tell you that, because they have security on top of anything they give you. Um, I would personally go the free route um, or a very inexpensive route. There's a lot of other providers, and the reason I say that, should you not set it up correctly at your house or a residence or somewhere, <laughs> and it gets honed, it looks really bad, I can tell you we run something similar to this type setup. Uh, inside consumers, and I worry deathly <laughs> that, it, that someone will figure out how to get into it. So I would s highly suggest you don't put it on any network you care about. Um, and just remember, though, like as Christian alluded to, he's actually showing you how he's getting to his systems, his dashboards and stuff. I would make sure that those management dashboards, those SSH pieces that you're using to manage it, are secured to a, a set of trusted IP addresses. Again, you missed that in the beginning, but thank you. <laughs> and there's MFA on it, so. Mm. Mm. Is that a certificate? <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> what happens at work stays at work. <laughs> there aren't, if there thank aren't you. any other questions, then. Good night. Thanks for speaking. <laughs>